Good afternoon. Can, can you hear me? Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm um, overwhelmed that there are so many people here in, in, uh, in Horsens um, who want to come and, and listen to contemporary performance art. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm very happy, very happy about this. Um, and if, if uh, one would multiply um, the factor of how many uh, less people there are in Horsens compared to uh, there are uh, people in Copenhagen, um, I, would have, uh, I, would, I would have to perform like in big stadiums. In Parken, I would have to perform in Parken, um, in in Copenhagen, um, um, and and I'm and I'm I'm very happy about this because of course, if you live if you live um, if you live in Copenhagen, um, you're a bit afraid of Jutland, and especially like me, you're a foreigner and you live in Copenhagen, then because then you know even less about Jutland than if you're. Uh, uh, a Danish person uh, living in Copenhagen, uh, because uh, of course we know that everyone, all the Danes who live in Copenhagen are from Jutland, um, so they know about Jutland. Um, but me, being a foreigner in Copenhagen, I don't know anything about Jutland. Uh, and then it's of course very nice to see so many people coming, coming like a whole stadium, Hele uh, Park in Bada, I can say. Um, and uh, now when we had this, I mean, because you were so many, we had to bring, uh, not me, but we, no, no they, um, people had to bring more chairs um, for people to sit on. Um, and then I got to think of this uh, game, which is called Musical Chairs. Musical Chairs. You, you know the game Musical Chairs. What is the game Musical Chairs called in Danish? Stoolelein. Which is... Which is a good, good, solid Jutish name for this game, um, uh, uh, because there. But I, I got got to think of musical chairs because there was music and chairs, so musical chairs. Um, in Sweden, it's called at least when I was I was growing up in Sweden, it's, it was called Hela Havet Stormar. Hela Havet Stormar. I, do you know the English word ventriloquist? Bootaler. Yeah, bootaler. Um, a ventriloquist is a person who people thought in the old days that this person spoke with his or her stomach, um, but this is not true. It's not true. It's, it, it's, it, in this case, the, the, the good Jutish name is not a good name uh, uh, because it's not true. Uh, however, you, you got it from the Germans. You got it from the Germans because the Germans call it Bauchredner. And uh, in Swedish, uh, it's called Buchtaler. But you didn't get it from Swedish. You got it from the, the, the Germans. Um, the Swedish also got it from the Germans. Maybe from the Danes. Um, um, but in English, it's called ventriloquist. And actually, uh, ventriloquist also means uh, uh, boot tail. Uh, it's I think it's Latin. Uh, uh, um, if it, maybe maybe it doesn't mean Boutella. I should. Does anyone know Latin? Yeah, vent. Yeah, vent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, in the United States, uh, in the good old days, this was like a very popular, uh, honest kind of entertainment, and uh, there were several ventriloquists, and one of them was Paul Winchell. And Paul Winchell, he was so famous that he had his own radio show in which he performed together with his puppets on the radio. And, um, and one evening he was to, uh, he was to perform, he, he was to form, uh, perform on, uh, on, Ed's, on the Ed Sullivan television show um, on TV with his puppets. And uh, uh, I just read the autobiography of Victor Bohr and then when Victor Bohr came to the United States, he started to perform in English within a year without, like, without previously having known the language. He went to the cinema and learned English, and then he started to perform in English. Um, and uh, the week he started to perform, um, 
uh, was on a radio show. It was on the Bing Crosby radio show. And the same week he had applied for a job on a filling station, like a petrol station. And they said, no, we don't want to hire you because we don't think your English is good enough. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then uh, the same week he got the job on this radio show um, and, and performed in English for 30 million people. Uh, so, and actually this, make, this makes me think of like at one point where I was sort of, I was, uh, I didn't know what to do with my life and I thought of, I had just started doing performance art but I, I wasn't sure if this was the thing and, and, uh, and in any case I needed a, a job that could you know, pay money. So I, I went and this was like at the height of the econ economic crisis in 2008. So there was like really no jobs to, to be had in Copenhagen. And then of course, there's also, always one kind of job that you can apply for on that, this as a salesman. And actually I had, uh, during a similar situation, I had worked as a salesman for a Swedish magazine on labor law. On labor law. Um, uh, what's this in English? Uh, uh, and we, we, called, we called employers and we said, if you don't keep up with the development of labor law, you, you're going to end up in court. You should buy our magazine. Um, and this worked very well. And even I, you know, the artist managed to sell a few subscriptions every day. So I thought, OK, it's desperate, but I can do this. And uh, I lived cl very close to uh, Rollhusplassen, where Politikens uh, Hus is, and there were these big advertisements on their uh, electronic newspaper saying, we were looking for salespeople. So I went up there and, uh, and uh, no, I didn't go. I, I called them first because that's what you do these days. I called them and I talked to the sales, sales manager and uh, the next day I got to talk to the sales manager and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the sales manager, he was like 24. He was 24 and uh, he showed me around and he, he, he showed me one of the old guys. He said, this, this is our best salesman. He used to be in the parliament. You know. Han har været medlem af Folketinget. Men nu arbejder han hos os. And he's making a million a year. You know, selling politiken uh, uh, on the phone. So if, if, if you ever get this phone call, they don't kill call people in Jutland, I don't think so. Maybe they do. Uh, if you ever get like a really smooth guy on the phone that sound like he, maybe he was in the parliament, that's him. You know, that's, the one, that's the one who's making a million a year. Uh, and, and if he's managed to sell a subscription to you, you know, he, he, he earns another 350 kroner. Mm. So I had this interview and blah, 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 blah. And then um, the, uh, the head of the sales there, uh, the 25-year-old guy, 24, 26 maybe, uh, he said, we'll call you. Don't call us, we'll call you. Um, and then uh, I thought I'd done a pretty good job there at the interview. And, uh, and, uh, and I said, you know, I mean, it's, it's uh, I know I have a Swedish accent when I speak Danish, but you know, I mean, you know, maybe people think it's you know original and charming because sometimes you know you have to be original and charming in in uh, in sales. For instance, in Sweden, like the best salespeople are the people with a, with an accent either from the north or from Gotland. Um, and Gotland, that's like that's not like having a, an accent from Jutland. That's like having an accent from Bornholm. That's like a heavy accent. <laughs> Uh, but the next day he, he, he called me and he said, no, we're worried about your language. So, and I didn't get the job, you know. So, so if you think that Politiken is, you know, this sort of left-wing liberal newspaper who's sort of, you know, okay with immigra immigration and so on, that might, be, oh, that might be, you know, what you might read in Politiken. But, you know, the sales, the sales department, they have different politics. I never told this to anyone before. Uh, I mean, not, not publicly. It was about time. It's about time. <clears throat> Anyways, Winchell, he was, he was on television. And uh, he noticed that there was a problem with the sound. They had, uh, in the studio, they had uh, a boom operator uh, who would hold a boom with a microphone at the end over whoever was speaking. 
Um, it was like when they good old, the good old days when they had real microphones on television, not these small small ones. You know, they have to save money. It's only to save money. The sound sound is really bad. Like people have bad hearing now. They say you know the sound on television has not been this bad. You know, uh, since television started, um, we're getting HD TV, right? But the sound just goes down. Um, so there was a boomer operator, and whenever Paul Winchell was speaking, the sound was fine. But when the when the puppet was speaking, the sound disappeared because the boom operator moved the microphone from Winchell to the puppet. I think that one of my favorite Danish uh, expressions is "die kaf bakam." It's, I think that this is, this is pure poetry. It's very beautiful. No, but we have to get serious here. Um, so we're, we're getting into the performance, which is about DRP3, which is turning 50 this month. It's turning 50 this month. And, and uh, you might have heard that uh, DR, they've moved, they moved uh, into uh, the DR city, DR Bune. And, uh, and I think this relocation of DR to the island of Amar is very suitable because isn't the principle of the whole operation of DR as a public service broadcasting organization, isn't the whole principle of how it should work, it should work like an Amar mail. <laughs> You know about the amamel here as well, right? Yeah. An amamel is a sandwich that's consisting of, of two different kinds of bread, uh, rye bread and, and wheat bread. And it's something you fool children with. You show them the wheat bread side. <laughs> and, and then they get some substance from the rye as well. Um, and this is how, how DR is working. You know, that there should be some fun and entertainment, but there should always be substance as well. So it should be good to the Danes, but it should also be good for the Danes. For the Danes. Uh, can you say this in Danish as well? Uh, no, you, you can only say this give a got for Danskola. And then it's sort of double, right? Um, uh, Got, it, got is it's a very versatile, versatile word. It, it can mean that it's nice, but it can also mean that it's good for you. Uh, uh, which is, yeah, that's it. The alte man öl. When when I when I was, yeah, no no more alcohol, no more alcohol. <laughs> Now, when I was 15, when I, back when I was a teenager in, in a very similar town to Horsens, which is called Helsingborg in Sweden, that's where I grew up. Um, but there was no art museum in Helsingborg. There was a, a very, very small one. Like a, there was a private villa. You know, there was a private villa. You could see the whole exhibition in, in, in one minute. Um, um, and, and, and now, of course, it's very different in Helsingborg. Helsingborg, because all those things that made things in Helsingborg, like there was a shoe factory, a rubber shoe factory, Treton, which made rubber shoes and rubber boots and tennis balls and even tennis rackets. They, for, in the beginning of the career of Björn Borg, they sponsored Björn Borg. And, and they had a very, very big uh, factory in Helsingborg because uh, Helsingborg was a, a harbor city. So all the katschuk that came from, from the south could then be shipped to Helsingborg and then be turned into rubber, rubber boots and, and tennis balls and so on. And, uh, and in 1980, when I was a teenager in this city where nothing much happened, I, uh, I saw Jörn Mülius on television. And I was sort of fell in love with Jörn Mülius because he was, he was like nothing I had seen on television, on Swedish monopoly public service television, because the same Sweden, same system in Sweden, like in, 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 uh, in Denmark. Um, I had never seen anything like it. And it, to me, it was sort of, in 1980, it was the gateway to the 80s. Um, I, in 1980, I didn't understand that we would get an 80s with all kinds, with, with, with the music and the fashion 
and all those things. And Jan Mulis was the first thing that sort of opened my eyes to the 80s. Um, and Jan Mulis was the first star I had seen on Swedish TV. Um, because there was, there was like more Rupel. I think there was more Rupel on Swedish TV than there was even on Danish TV. We didn't have a Jan Mulis. And of course, the Swedish Rupel Knäckepel, which is like really, you know, hard, hard to chew. Um, and I was so excited that I even bought the theme song, Hit, which was composed by Tommy Seebach. And I, I fell in love with the way Jan Mulis was speaking, not only that he was speaking Danish, which is a more beautiful language than Swedish, but also the way he was speaking Danish. Um, and generally, I thought he was a star. And I think Jan Mulis still is a great star. And I think he's getting too little credit you know, for the star he is here in Denmark. And it's, of course, because there's Jantelon, Jantelon um, in, in Denmark. And, and uh, you, the, only way, the only way you can become a big star in Denmark is like do like Victor Bo and, and you know, leave the country completely for many, many years and then come back and only speak English. <laughs> um, like, uh, Kim Larsen, he tried, he tried to go to America, but he didn't stay away. He didn't stay away for long enough. And you know, when he came back, he still spoke Danish. <laughs> but when I'm calling John Mulius, John Mulius, this is not out of disrespect. It's out of respect. I think if you're a star, if you're a star like John Mulius, then you can't change your name. You can't change your name. You can't go back. Even if it's your real name, I know that his real name is John Demilius, but I think that once you call yourself something and you become a star, then you owe it to your fans to stick to it. Like when, when John Demilius was on Swedish television in 1980, he had been a star for twice as long as David Bowie. He had been a star for 17 years. He'd been a star since since P3 started, um, he, he did his first program on P3, January 29, 1963. He'd been a star for twice as long as David Bowie. Uh, but David Bowie would never change his name back to David Jones. Like all through the changes, Siggy Stardust, Major Tom, the, the Pierrot costume on, on the cover of Ashes to Ashes, all these manipulations of his stage persona, he's still sticking to David Bowie. And, and no one would think it'd be very radical for him to just call himself, you know, David Jones. It would be as pathetic as when Kiss made that album where they took off the makeup. I mean, this, I mean that maybe worked, you know, for one, you know, one time, but you know, what should they do afterwards, you know? And now they have the makeup again. Uh, in, in, um, in 1980, when I saw, saw Jan Mulius, he had been a star for as long as Ringo Starr had been a star since 1963. But Ringo Starr, he would never change his name back. I mean, if, if he suddenly would, would make an album now calling his, himself Richard Starkey, people would ask themselves, what's going on now with Ringo? You know, does he have a crisis? I think even Jan Mulius now on P4, he would ask himself, the whole Denmark through the microphone in the studio of P4, he would ask himself, what is going on with Ringo Starr? But then he should ask himself, what is going on with Jan Mulius? Um, like, I think not even when he was like really high on LSD did Ringo Starr ever think of changing his name back. Like not, not even way down, way down in the yellow submarine did he think of changing his, his name back. So I, I, I don't, does anyone know when this happened? When I'm, I, I was away from Denmark for a while and then I came back and suddenly John Mulius was John to Mulius. When Does anyone know when this happened? Did it happen in the 90s? We don't know. You're, you're too young. You think, you think, you think he's been John de Mulius the whole time, but I'm telling you, no, when I was young, he, he wasn't John, John de Mulius. He was John Mulius. Um, and, and I think he should stick to being a star. You know, although there, you know, there's the Jantelow, you know, he should, 
he should, someone, you know, Victor Bohr, he broke through the Yamta law, you know, but he, he started speaking English. You know, I think, I think someone, I think there should be one person allowed to be an, a star in Denmark, and I think John Mulius, he's the best, did the best of boon, you know. Um, and uh, he should change, he should change, change his name back immediately to, to his star, star name. And, I mean, not even on the bus 3A, in Copenhagen, which is the worst bus in Copenhagen. I, the, the, this, it all, it's always shaking and the drivers are sort of accelerating and then stopping and it's like not at all nice, uh, this bus. And it ha this is the bus that happens to be Jörn Müller's local bus. It's driving past, it's driving past uh, his home on Felix Bear. It's also driving past his old home on, on, on Österpol. Um, but not even on that bus, he should have thought of changing back his name. Um, um, and this, the, th the strange thing now is that through the Danish Jante law, Jörn Mulius, in order to then sh pr prove that he's a normal person and he doesn't want to have like a star name like David Bowie or Ringer Star, he then changed his name back to his real name. So everyone, you know, everyone who's sort of punking him for having been uh, everyone who's been, he, he's tried to make people happy by changing his star name back to his real name. So he's gone from Jörn Mulius to Jörn de Mulius. And then, of course, after that, people accuse him of being a snob. <laughs> this is deeply ironic that because, because of the Jante law, you know, then he's accused of being a, a snob and, a, you know, trying to be aristocratic. Um, that's to thank, thanks, I guess. Um, but then you say, Denmark says, well, Jan Mulius, he's not a star like David Bowie or Ringo Starr. But have you thought about that in England? You know, David Bowie and Ringo Starr, they're English, right? And, and in England, where people even speak English, you know, and they, they, they even speak English and they eat bad food. <laughs> they still think Ringo Starr and David Bowie are stars. You know, they're speaking the same language, they're eating the same food, and they still think that you know, these people living among them, um, they're still stars. But Denmark doesn't think that Jan Milius is a star because Denmark has the highest tax in the world on butter. I think that this is the reason. Denmark is, making, Denmark is making the best butter in the world, and then Denmark puts the highest tax in the world on butter, so that Danes can't enjoy it. A <laughs> hundred years ago, in the deep, dark, green woods of Sweden, and on the bleak, barren fields of Sweden, Almost every Swede had a name ending with son, like my, my name, Olson, because almost every Swede was a peasant. And son meant son, and the son should take over the farm, if there was a farm. But the woods and the fields didn't yield very much, and the Swedish peasants were very, very poor and had almost nothing to eat. So one million Swedes left for America between 1890 and 1910. One million Swedes, that was like a, a fifth of the population, one million out of five million. And the corresponding figure for Denmark was only 200,000 because you had, you, you know, you had, you had rye bread and you had butter and you know, you were doing, <laughs> you were doing better. And there was not this ridiculous tax on butter then. <laughs> Uh, and the people who didn't leave, they turned to the vodka bottle. <laughs> or maybe it was the other, other way around, that it was the people who were sober enough to be able to leave who left. <laughs> well, one of those people who, um, who was too drunk to leave was my great-grandfather, the father of my grandfather. Um, the neighbors, they left for America, but he stayed because he was too drunk. He was too drunk to leave. He was too drunk to leave. Um, 
Um, and then my grandfather, he, he left home when he was 16 and he got himself, he walked to the nearest university town, Lund, and he got himself an education he, and he became a school teacher and he became one of those new, new uh, kinds of men and women, rather sober, uh, uh, who, who created the Swedish welfare state. With the super, sober super workers who, who, who produced cars and ball bearings and all kinds of fantastic things. And, and it was you know, completely new Sweden. And, and like the, 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 the Swedes who had emigrated and came back, they were completely confused when they came back. Um, and when I saw Jan Mulis on Swedish TV in 1980, the Swedish welfare state, it was in full bloom. And, and, and by that, by that time, they, the Swedish welfare state was in so, so much full bloom that they, they even thought that they could afford themselves you know, a little decadence and have Jan Mulius on Swedish Monopoly TV. With, with, his, with, with all the makeup he was wearing and his electric hair. Uh, and I remember it as it, it was standing up, but it wasn't standing up because I've just looked at the photos, but there was still something electric about the hair. Maybe I think it was the way they put the light on the hair, like a little bit from the back which was like very, very fashionable in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, the backlit hair. Yeah? You, we got a photographer here, right? Yeah. Actually, he, he, he's the ex-boyfriend of my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> we, we've got things to talk about. Uh, uh, um, but they had this light. I mean, not, I'm not telling you that. I'm not saying that you're as old as I. But you know, it's, as a photographer, you know the history of photography. Um, they had this backlit hair, um, and I think that was the way John Mulius' hair, you know, looked electric. Although it wasn't standing up, like uh, you know, a lot of people's hair in the 80s, you know, was standing up. Um, um, and. Uh, yeah, there were all these efficient uh, workers and they were relatively sober. Because after the First World War in Sweden, Sweden had um, state control over the sales of alcohol. Um, you, had, you could only go to one kind of store and buy alcohol in Sweden, and that was the, the system. System, but no, no, this, I got this system wrong. Oh, okay. And actually, I have, I have to, this is very sensitive. I see that, that the signs get on the video as well. Um, so, Systembolaget. Um, ha, has anyone been to a Systembolaget? Yeah, yeah, okay. If, if you're going for wine, I can recommend the Côte de Rhone by Vidal Fleury. It's a, it's a good, it's a, it's a good wine. Côte de Rhone is a good wine. And Vidal Fleury, they're making really a great Côte de Rhone. Um, and so system blog, they should, they, should, uh, they should sell alcohol to the Swedes, but preferably not too much, right? So this is a, a strange kind of um, double position. And system blog, they even, they even had campaigns against drinking. Uh, like, like the famous Spula Kröken campaign that started uh, already 71 and, and went on all all the way until the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, but there was, of course, no connection. Um, <laughs> and uh, on this sticker here, it says, do like the orienteerers, Spula Kraken. And Spula Kraken is, is a very idiomatic Swedish expression. Uh, do we have any person who knows Swedish here? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Uh, it's as difficult to explain to a foreigner as hygge. It's very, very dramatic, but but literally it means flush the booze, flush the booze, like you know, stop drinking. And uh, the interesting thing is that in 79, 1979, the Swedish state they launched a branded premium vodka, a branded premium vodka, and this vodka had a bottle very much looking like this bottle. <laughs> And the typography on the bottle was exact the same, the, exactly the same typography as Spula Kraken. It was Futura condensed uh, extra bold. So you see. <laughs> you, you, you see the text here. It's the same, it's the same font, and, and the, the bottles are very, very similar. similar. So, 
So, so, so while the, the Swedish state, they, they were selling designer vodka to the Americans, they, they told the Swedes to spula, to spula kraken. But in Denmark, things are not like that at all. In, in Denmark, drinking alcohol is concerned, it's considered to be a basic, not drinking and buying alcohol, um, and buying it uh, whenever you like and wherever you like, and how much you like is considered to be a basic human right in Denmark. It's, it's, it's like owning a gun in the United States. <laughs> you know, and, and, and if someone would come and mess, mess with this, you know, you know they, 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 they would get as much trouble as you know, someone who would, who's trying to you know, do something about the gun laws in, in, uh, in the United States. And I'm not trying to compare those you know, in, 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 in any other way, you know. That, that, that I know that there are no, no people, you know, going to schools, throwing beer bottles on the students and, you know, killing them. You know, this is not happening. Uh, because, because people prefer to, to drink the beer themselves. Um, and this, this has been a basic human right as far as, far as uh, as any Dane can remember, as, as, as far as uh, when the Danes came to the conclusion that it was sort of nicer to get drunk on alcohol than, than by, speci spe uh, by eating mushrooms. Um, in 1925, a new invention came to Denmark, radio, 1925. Um, but the Danish state, they were a bit worried about this new invention. And what they were worried about was that if anyone could start a radio station anywhere, um, the, the airwaves around Denmark would be completely full, full, um, full, uh, full of, of uh, of jazz music, that would be, and, and, and the Danish state, they were afraid that there would be too much jazz and, and that the Danes would go crazy dancing uh, 24 hours a day to all this jazz music. So they decided that, that there should be a state monopoly on broadcasting and there should only be Statsradiofonin broadcasting. Uh, um, and once in a while Statsradiofonin did broadcast some jazz music because after all, Statsradiofonin was the radio for all Danes, also the Danes that liked jazz, but you know, under, under, uh, under controlled forms, so to say. But in 1958, this young man here in the middle, Per Janssen, uh, in Copenhagen, uh, he got an idea, and his idea was that if if he would take a ship and put it outside Denmark on international waters, he could put a transmitter on that ship and from that transmitter he could play as much jazz music to the Danes as he wanted. And this, this became the beginning of Radio Mercur, which started in, in 1958. And uh, Radio Mokur, they played jazz. And Radio Mokur even played rock and roll. <laughs> and and this, made, this made the, the Danish government very upset. They didn't like this at all. Um, and, and what they absolutely didn't like was that when, when this radio station had broadcast for four years and they had 2.5 million listeners out of four million living in Denmark. Um, um, the funny thing was that like everyone was doing fine, you know, like the, you know, nothing very much radical had happened to the Danes. Um, maybe they were, you know, slight, slightly more happy um, but, but all those terrible things that would have happened if the Danes had free access to jazz, 
didn't happen. Uh, it, it's like if, if uh, one suddenly would stop Systembolaget in Sweden and just you know, sell alcohol in every kiosk and the, the Swedes still would be doing fine. Um, so it was a loss of prestige and embarrassing and thus Radio Mercur had to be stopped. Uh, and of course Radio Mercur, they financed their, their transmissions with advertising and, uh, and people had nothing against the advertising and sometimes they even did what the advertising told them to do. So for instance, there, there, was, uh, there was an advertising for trips to Mallorca. And it went like this. Um, and now I'm, I'm going to prove that I, I shouldn't have been hired by Politiken, because now I'm going to try to speak Danish. I väl dåligt och humörsloit. Så fly till Mallorca med Aero Lloyd. Is the weather bad and the mood gloomy? Then fly to Mallorca with Aero Lloyd. And people flew to, flew to Mallorca, and people flew to Mallorca, although Spain, which Mallorca is a part of, was ruled by General Franco, a fascist dictator. Um, and one of those people who heard this um, advertisement, uh, that was the grandson of my great grandfather, uh, that is my father. <laughs> And, and, and he, I think he still had, you know, I still, I still think he had sort of the gene of, you know, parching in his blood because he decided to go to Mallorca. And uh, in Mallorca, he, um, he, he met my mother, a, a Dutch woman um, whom he married. And, uh, and uh, this woman became my mother. And uh, my father became my father. <laughs> uh, and of course, then Radio Moku was stopped by the Danish government, uh, by the Danish parliament, actually. There was a vote. They introduced a new law, and there was a vote. And, and the new law uh, became law. And for me, of course, it's lucky that this law wasn't introduced earlier. <laughs> because then I wouldn't have been standing here in Horsens speaking, speaking to you today, which is, of course is a thing that I, you know, for, for my life wouldn't have missed. <laughs> um, it's like Victor Borger says in his autobiography, I always wished, I always wished that I was born on a Sunday, and I was. <laughs> My father, he had a great interest in radio. He was sort of one of these hobby, I mean, in, in the 1950s, people had hobbies, you know, because uh, people, you know, there were not 79 TV channels. People had hobbies, you know, they made their own knives or they built a summer house or, or something. And, uh, and my father's hobby was to listen to foreign radio stations, um, and not only Radio Moku, but also radio stations far away. And actually my father, he became the Swedish champion of shortwave listening. Uh, is, like, is there anyone who's old enough to remember that there was such a hobby? Yeah, it's called, it's called DXing. It was called DXing. Um, yeah, uh, maybe. Um, and and he was the Swedish champion uh, uh, many times, and so he and he won like big prizes, like a TV uh, and a tape recorder and a big uh, a big uh, big corner loudspeaker. Uh, like uh, loudspeaker, you put in the corner. Uh, um, uh, things were much easier then because you didn't have stereo. You know, it was much it was much easier to to um, with interior decoration. You could just have one speaker and put it wherever you like. Uh, and uh, if you had a lot of money, you could have a corner loudspeaker, a big one. Um, and um, and he also got these trophies, and the trophies they were sponsored by Lackerol. <laughs> Which is like very, you know, very clever. You, you know Lackerol, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's sort of the Swedish gayol, right? Um, 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 and uh, there was a slogan for Lackerol, but I forgot what it was. Makes pe makes people talk. Makes people talk. Yeah, but it's a long time. They've sort of their profile is sort of. 
You don't hear so much of Lacquerol these days. You know, in, there used to be Lacquerol in the tax free stores. Now there's only Toblerone, but a lot of, there's a lot of Toblerone. But Toblerone, Tobl Toblerone doesn't make people talk, you know. <laughs> and, and if Toblerone makes people talk, it, it makes people talk Swiss German, which is impossible to understand. Um, He also participated in various quizzes and competitions uh, on these foreign radio stations. And back then, they were behind the Iron Curtain, like in, in Poland and East Germany and, um, and Soviet Russia and so on. There were a lot of propaganda transmitters transmitting in Swedish, and I think some of them even in Danish. And, and my, father's, uh, my father's talent for language wasn't that great. I don't know how, like, I don't know how he actually chatted up my mother. Um, my mother is very good with languages, but my father not, and I don't. Maybe it was just body language. I, I didn't. I, I haven't asked them. I haven't asked them. I, I, my mother is very, very shy. My my mom, mother is very, very shy, and and uh, I'm, I I know she wouldn't have taken the initiative. Uh, um, and I think if she would have spoken German to my father, my father would have understood, but I don't think he would have said anything. Um, because back then, when my father was young, this was like German was you know, the first language you, you would learn um, in school. Um, uh, and uh, one of those uh, quizzes that he participated in was uh, a quiz uh, on a radio station called Radio Berlin International, which was a propaganda transmitter from East Germany. And he won a trip to East Germany, to Rostock, to an international peace week, to an international Baltic peace week in Rostock. Rostock uh, is by the sea um, uh, for two people. Like, so, so he and my mother went to Rostock. But this was when I was eight months old, so they couldn't really leave me behind. You know? They thought I would be unhappy. So my first trip abroad was to East Germany, to this communist dictatorship. Um, and I, I wonder how this has affected me. Uh, I, I seem to have a great interest for anything that happened in East Germany. And, and uh, whenever I come to, to that part of the world, you know, I go to flea markets and buy you know, old East German things because they, they have a certain charm. I mean, it was a communist dictatorship and they, they killed people who tried, to, f tried to, to get out of there and so on. And it was horrible, but, you know, but, you know it's, it's still fascinating to me. Um, um, and um, I, I, th I think it must have been as a great culture shock, you know, coming from you know, relatively stable social democrat Sweden to communist, communist uh, East Germany. Um, but then finally, in 1962, uh, uh, the German politicians, they closed Radio Merkur. It, you know, now the fun, the fun should stop. Um, so, so uh, like Sweden had alcohol under state control, Denmark got jazz and rock and roll <laughs> under state control. I think we, we brought too many chairs. We brought too many chairs. Because if we had had you know, just a few more chairs, so, so if, you know, some people would have been standing. You know, the people who would be sitting would be very happy that they would be sitting. <laughs> and you know, if, if they would leave their chairs, they thought, we would think, well, then some of the people standing will you know, take my chair. And that, that, that is sort of intuitively, you don't want to do that, right? Most, I mean, but, but it's like, you know, my, my mother was Catholic, uh, and uh, in order for her to be allowed to, to marry my father, uh, uh, she had to marry Catholic. Like my, her father you know, was very insistent that my mother marry had a Catholic marriage, but this didn't mean that my father had to become a Catholic. <laughs> uh, but, but they had to promise the priest who married them, they had to promise the whole Catholic Church that their children would get a Catholic upbringing. So this was sort of a pragmatic policy of the Catholic Church. 
like saying to the husband, you don't have to join us, but the children. Um, so, uh, and my mother had seven brothers and seven sisters from, from a big, uh, big Catholic family in, in, in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, what was I talking about? What, 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 I, what, what was I talking about before that? <laughs> People leaving? I mean, if my mother would come and she would bring her brothers and sisters, then already I would have had a you know, pre pretty good audience. Um, and I've got 50 cousins, you know. <laughs> you know and I, I could sort of tour with my 50 cousins all over Jutland and you know, have a pretty good, pretty good audience. Even in Vipo, I could have a pretty good audience. Um, I was going to say something. Okay. Well, um, imagine, imagine a civilization on another planet in another solar system um, vastly, vastly more advanced and sophisticated and civilized than ours. And imagine an anthropologist from that planet visiting Denmark, for instance, here in Horsens. Um, and this, this is a very sophisticated civilization, so this anthropologist has the ability to look like a you know, normal Danish person. Um, um, and uh, has the ability to learn Danish in just a few days, and has the ability to, you know, more or less behave like a Danish person. Um, and this person moves around here in Horsens, for instance, and, and listens to, to the Danes, and listens to their stories, and, and what they have to say, and so on. And everything goes fine, and he or she or it, we don't know what kind of you know, system of reproduction they have on this planet, um, you know, works on, on the report of how things are going on uh, in Denmark, uh, on planet Earth. But then he or she or it comes into a taxi. And I know there are taxis here in Horsens because I took it. I had a lot of luggage and I had to take a taxi here. Um, and, um, and then they play the radio. They play P3 in the taxi. And this, is, this comes as a bit as a shock to the anthropologist because of all the Danes he or she or it has been speaking to here in Horsens, no one has been speaking like they're speaking on P3. And we're not talking about the accent. We're not talking about the accent. It's just like the mode, this very enthusiastic, this forced enthusiastic way of speaking is a bit like a shock. Um, and then he or she or it comes into another taxi and listens to this like pop radio station, The Voice. And then, of course, it's even more shocking hearing The Voice. Have you got The Voice here also? Yeah. Um, because on this planet where this anthropologist is coming from, they don't have like the communication, the kind of communication that we have with words and pictures. Like everyone is just connected. You know, it's like a more advanced, it's sort of mixing the internet with biology. Uh, it's sort of like you know, putting an iPhone right into your brain uh, with you know, the 24 hour connection and, 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 and having something like Facebook, but sort of you know, much more sophisticated. And there's a state law that you have to be signed up with Facebook and you have to transmit all your feelings all the time which means that everyone knows what's going on and no one is feeling misunderstood. There are no crying children because there are no children that is feeling misunderstood. There are feeling misunderstood. And there's no rock and roll because there's like new, no youth frustration. You know, everyone is understanding anyone else all the time. So there's harmony. So this idea that you know, someone is just speaking out into the air in the radio to someone but you know, just some. But, but we're not sure who. This seems like a very strange thing to to this anthropologist, because in this in this society where he, she, or it comes from, every, all all communication is direct. Um, now tonight. Okay. No, this, I, I wrote the script for the premiere in in. Uh, in uh, in uh, in Copenhagen, I, I I mean I always change it because uh, you you had to print it right. Yeah, tonight I missed this one. Today, today, 
today, I would have wanted to be that intergalactic anthropologist. Pause it. Um, today, I would have wanted to be that intergalactic anthropologist. And I want, would have wanted to penetrate as far as possible into the mystery of the punk, funky, the funky speech on DRP3, the state-controlled popular channel in Denmark. However, the sales department, the sales department of the National Danish Public Radio, Dias Salsaudini. <laughs> who is controlling the copyright of all the dusty radio shows of P3 and all the dusty radio shows of P1 and P2 as well, they are South South Dealing. They have not been very willing to let me play any clips from DRP3. Like, not even in Vibo. <laughs> um, and, uh, okay, I mean, we had two people in Vibo, but I mean, here, the, I mean, there are a lot, I don't know, so, I don't know, 70 or 60? But I mean, all in all, even if we would have such a fantastic turnout, like here, you know, the, 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 the sum of the people attending these small, you know, get-togethers, they would not be more than 450. You know, if you took all the people from all the tour, 450 people, and, and uh, the people who, who've hired me, you know, all the sponsors that are on the poster, they, they, they said that they were perfectly willing to pay them, you know, a lot of money, at least I thought it was a lot of money. Um, uh, but that didn't make them happy either. And they never said quite no, but they never said yes either, you know. Um, and and uh, so, and, and uh, like five days before the tour was, was going to start, there was still no clear skill. Um, and then, you know, I, I decided to say like, like uh, the film star, what's the film star called? Uh, Did I take him out of the script? Oh. <laughs> Who's the, you, you remember with the, with, the, with the film star who said forget about it? Who was, who was in the mafia film? Al Sorry? Al Pacino. Al Pacino, yeah. I would have said like Al Pacino, forget about it. <laughs> or, or, or was it Johnny Depp? <laughs> Did the, do you remember, did you see this nice, it was a very beautiful film where, where, where Al Pacino was like this old guy in the mafia, but he, was, he wasn't a star in the mafia, he was sort of, sort, of, sort of medium mafia guy. And then he became friends with Johnny Depp who was an undercover agent. And there was tension because they were friends but Johnny Depp was a traitor. And, and maybe it was Johnny who said forget about it. Did you see this film? It, who, 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 yeah, who said forget about it? Uh, okay, I have to research this. It sounds more like Johnny Depp than Al Pacino, right? I mean, if, if Al Pacino would say forget about it, it would take a long time because it, <laughs> he, speaks, he speaks so slowly. <laughs> yeah, but, but Johnny was at forget about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm very good at, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm very bad at, I'm very bad at imitations. I'm very bad at imitations. Um, so in, instead, Instead, um, I have uh, brought with me a record, and that is a cover of a record, um, of uh, a record with East German comedians, East German stand-up comedians. Um, and I would have wanted to show this, I would have show, wanted to show you um, this, uh, this cover, um, but I forgot the cover in Vipo. <laughs> And, and I'm not saying that any of the two people in the audience stole it, but, but I, I showed it to the audience and then, then there was like a bookshelf, beside, no, it's a, a, a Zeitschrift, Zeitschriftschrank, uh, no, a, what is it called, a, a, a magazine stand. And it's, it seemed like I could put it there beside me and then one could see the cover while I continued to speak. And there, you know, it was. And then, 
you know, I, I tried to get the uh, Kunsthalle in Viborg to send the cover to 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 my hotel in Esbjerg, but I, I don't know. Maybe the post between Viborg and Esbjerg is difficult, but it, it's it's somewhere. I, you know, I, I hope it's somewhere. Uh, I didn't bring the record. I just brought the cover because I thought it would be sort of very very uh, problematic to bring a record player on this tour as well. And uh, not all art institutions um, around uh, Denmark uh, have record players. Um, so, and so what, what I've done, what I did, but I wanted to show the cover, but now I can't show the cover, and this is, um, this is a bit sad. But it's, it's a, a cover from, I would say, it's, uh, as far as I could understand, there, there was a year somewhere on the cover, and it was 1971, and it says, Comico Parade. Uh, and there's a drawing, there's a drawing uh, of someone playing a, a, a postil, right? Is it called this in Danish? Liakasse, yeah. I don't know what it's called in English. Uh, 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 I don't know why he's there, because there's no one playing this on the record. Uh, but it, there's a drawing of such a person. And then there are some photos of the various comedians, black and white, in, in some sort of frames. And he's sort of pointing towards the comedians. And, and, uh, and of course, you ask yourself, how can you have comedy in a communist totalitarian state? How can you have like communist comedy about life? communist life in a communist state. And, and this, is, this is, thank God, you know, one of those contradictions that exist even in a totalitarian state. And maybe you can even have comedy in Dea's Salsa Odini. And they're saying to themselves, we're going to stop, you know, this performance artist, you know, he can't be any good. You know, he, he uh, his, He's, they, they've checked me up on the internet. They found out that I've been speaking about my mother and father meeting uh, uh, on Mallorca, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I was conceived under the shadow of Franco, and, and, and I'm brave enough to confess it. You know, I'm brave enough, brave enough to confess that, you know, I'm, I'm a result of politically, uh, political in, uh, incorrectness. So what couldn't I figure out to say about DRP3? If I would, you know, if I was allowed to play the various examples of, you know, their funky DJs through the ages. And they decided not to take that risk, and here we are then with you know, the comedy record from, from the GDR. And, and I'm not going to play uh, any of these comedians, but some, some of the comedies is, is quite, it's quite sophisticated. For instance, there's this dialogue between two comedians, and then it's the typical sort of division of labor between like, the, the smart comedian and the stupid comedian. And the smart comedian says to the stupid comedian, you have nothing, you have no business on this stage, leave the stage. But the, the stupid comedian doesn't want to leave the stage. And then the smart comedian insists, and the smart comedian says to the stupid comedian, if you don't leave the stage immediately, all this in German, of course, if you don't leave the stage immediately, you're going to experience something you've never experienced before. Now, in East Germany, there were a lot of products that were hard to get um, because they were so isolated. And coffee was one of those products because they could only get coffee from Cuba. I don't even know if they grow coffee on Cuba. Um, or you know, they could get coffee from one of those small communist states um, in South America until the CIA you know, stopped them being communist states so that they wouldn't get any coffee in East Germany. because. Sooner or later, the CIA knew that if they had no coffee in East Germany, you know, they would overthrow, overthrow the government. You know, I, 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 uh, I mean, I, I was on a trip. I was on a trip in Russia once. You know, when Russia had turned capitalist, I was on a trip in Russia, and, and they don't really drink coffee in Russia. They they drink, they drink tea there. But Russia is different from Germany, and you know, these Germans they wanted coffee. The Russians, they don't care. They, you know, as long as they get tea, it's okay. But I, I really, you know, I need coffee. And I can't drink tea. I'm actually allergic to tea. And I was in Russia on an Esperanto Congress, you know, far, far away, you know, half the way to the Urals. And, uh, 
And, uh, and usually we could get coffee at the Esperanto Congress, but then one morning, you know, the, the, the ladies in the kitchen who had been there like for 30 years, it was in an old pioneer camp in the woods, they said, there's no more coffee, we're out of coffee. I mean, what? And all the others, they would say, what? Um, and then on the trip back, you know, I, 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 and the, the, bus, the bus with the Esperantists who had been to the Esperanto camp in Kovrov, and then the two buses, old buses, taking the Esperanto people back to Moscow, and then from Moscow we would go back to wherever we, we came from in the world. The bus stopped somewhere, and I sort of risked my life and risked missing the bus because I had seen some sort of stand where they were selling food to truck drivers, and they were selling these this grilled meat on skewers, like th these big pieces of meat, you know, like uh, to the truck drivers, and also coffee to the truck drivers. And I ran over there and, and risked my life and risked getting stuck there because I needed coffee. And I thought, I think the CIA, you know, I mean, what, why should the CIA, you know, have all these fascist dictatorships in South America? I think it was to control the coffee. Um, um, and, and, and I mean, it's, I don't know. But anyways, so the smart comedian, he says, if you don't leave the stage immediately, you're gonna experience something you never experienced before. And then the stupid comedian says, what, will there be coffee? <laughs> and, and I'm not gonna play a comedian, but there, there's an announcer who sort of who sort of introduces the record, who introduces this collection of comedy. And he speaks about our then listening to these different comedians as a trip, you know, as a voyage. Uh, so he's asking the audience, are you sitting all right? Because if you're sitting bequem, uh, then the, vo the, the trip will be more pleasant, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and he, he's sort of a, you know, he's sort of a, the interesting thing is that, you know, I mean, it's not like P3, but the, it's still some attempt on funkiness, you know, in this case, totalitarian funkiness. It's a bit funky, yeah? And, and, and especially in the end, I presume some of you know, actually know German, right? Uh, and, uh, and especially towards the end there, when he said, also, rille frei, wir sind auf den richtigen Kurs. Or dem richtigen Kurs? Keep the groove open, that is like the record groove, um, we're on our right way, um, you know, in, in the trip through, through these uh, comedians. And, uh, and of course, this thing with like being on our right way is sort of a bit ironic because in East Germany, yeah, I mean, you couldn't, the only, I mean, the only trip you could take, you know, would be on a record and then go towards the center. You could certainly not leave the country. But the question is, is one able to hear, when one is listening to this recording, is one able to hear that this is a totalitarian, funky voice? And this thought that one could hear that this is a totalitarian, funky voice, this is a bit of a frightening thought that even a funky announcer voice in a communist dictatorship would bear the, the mark of totalitarianism. But the other, the other thought is frightening as well, I think, that even 
even that a voice, that a voice, that uh, a funky announcer voice in a totalitarian state can can sound funky without bearing any mark at all of totalitarianism. This, this is also frightening. You know, that, 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 you know, all these terrible things are happening around this funky voice, and it doesn't affect the voice at all. And my German is not good enough to sort of be able to hear what's going on in this voice. And, and, do we have anyone here who, who's got like German as his or her first language? Or you know, did, did, did anyone hear totalitarianism in this voice? <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. No. Uh, um, thank God, like it's only the record cover. It's only record cover that's gone. And uh, I have the record at home, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to send it to Germany for analysis. Um, now, to begin with, like for any kind of announcer or DJ um, here in Northern Europe, it's like a very contrived thing. It's it's not natural for people in Northern Europe to sound funky. It's very different, like for you know, for an American or an Italian or a French person or Brazilian. These people they can sound funky completely naturally, like you know, just by ordering a coffee they can sound funky. <laughs> Going out with the trash they can sound funky, but but for us, you know, we 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 don't we don't try we can't sound funky just like that. You know, if we drink a lot of vodka, then we can sound funky. But we can't, we can't have DJs on the radio drinking vodka, especially not on DR. Uh, we, can, we cannot have DJs uh, sounding funky. Um, and Kraftwerk, the German pop group, they, they understood this. And, and they became funky by being as unfunky as possible. You know, this, this, they had figured it out. And I think this is, this, is the, this is the dilemma with having pop radio in, in a country like Denmark. And I think this is why at least I get so shocked when I hear the voice, definitely, and, but also P3, that it, it's, it's not natural. It's not natural to have people sounding like that. Um, um, and maybe, Maybe it would, would have been better if they had just you know, imported DJs from the United States. Uh, and it would have been fun if they had imported DJs from France and Italy as well. You know, because then we could, you know, uh, you know, we could learn some you know, basic DJ terms in Italian and French as well. I mean, because these people, I mean, they're not, I mean, not, they're not there to tell us you know anything important? You know, it's enough that there's someone there sounding, in, sounding, sounding enthusiastic. It could be even like some kind of intergalactic, funky DJ. Uh, we're not listening to these people. Um, but of course, this could work on the voice, but n not quite on P3 because P3 they're caught in the Amamel dilemma. <laughs> You know, they, 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 still, they still can't, I mean, it, it, P3, they can't sound like the voice, you know, they have to sound a little bit like P1 on P3. But if you listen to P1, they are sounding more and more like P3. Because they're afraid of loosening their listeners, you know, they, they don't have these old guys, they don't have die gamle stolo. You know, they're, they're going out. And, 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 and the young people, you know, it, it, it's, not like in, it's not like in the good old days that, you know, it was, I mean, I think this is, P1 is also a victim of their own snobbishness because they didn't want to hire young journalists right away, you know, because, you know, they're, they're the serious channel. So usually the people who come to P1 now, they've been on P3, but they're too old for P3, and then they come to P1. Um, so P1 is starting to sound like, like uh, P3 a bit, while P3 sounds a bit like P1 because they can't sound like the voice. It's the Amamel dilemma. <laughs> and this dilemma is reminding us of 
of how industrial design looked like in East Germany, when East Germany still was, you know, behind the Iron Curtain, where they had, on the one hand, they had to cre create these socialist objects, you know, good, solid socialist objects. Um, but on the other hand, they couldn't completely ignore that the East Germans could watch West German television and see what kind of products the West Germans had. And, and they felt a certain desire for these kinds of products. So the industrial design in East Germany was some sort of combination of like socialist objects and desirable objects. And, and the, the obje the, 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 we got these kinds of objects that, that you know, they, they tried to do two things at one time. So, so they ended up looking like lost children. You know, not, 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 I mean, this is, this is a perfect industrial design. Everything, everything here says, you know, I am a tape recorder for children, you know, with primary colors and so on, which I also thought this would be very, a very good thing to, you know, to play this totalitarian voice on because that would make the totalitarian voice, you know, a little bit less dangerous being, you know, played on such an obvious tape recorder for, for children. So in 1963, Denmark got jazz and rock and roll under state control. And the first broadcast took place the 1st of January, 1963 at 12 o'clock. And in Copenhagen, in Østerbro in Copenhagen, a 16 year old boy, Jörn Müllius, he listened to the new channel and he was a bit disappointed. It didn't sound like Radio Mercur. It did definitely not sound like Radio Luxembourg, which had also been the inspiration for Radio Mercur. And he wrote a letter complaining, um, the, um, and uh, and he sent the letter. And then you know he had worked off his steam, and then you know he didn't think about it. But they called him. They called him and asked him to come to the radio, um, and uh, and explain what was wrong. And he, they put him right on the air, so he got to explain what was wrong on the air. And then they offered him to be a DJ on P3, um, or at least make one program. But then it just continued, and it still is continuing. But now he's on P4. Um, and the great thing with John Milius is that he's not trying to sound funky, and he doesn't try to sound serious either. He was just like a boy who loved rock and roll and who took rock and roll seriously. And if P3 should be a channel for popular music, that is what he thought P3 should do. Um, so he's been playing the music that he loves and he loves speaking about it because he loves the music and everything comes natural. And, and I think if everyone would do this, you know, there would be no problems. And, and, uh, and it, it's like, uh, with all things in life, if we think too much about what people would think of what we would do, then you know, we, we, we were not able to do anything. Um, no, we're, we're very close to the end now. We're, 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 <laughs> We're, we're, um, it's less than 10% left. Um, um, uh, three, three pages. Like, it's page 30, 31, and 32. And there will be no more improvisation. I mean, that's, uh, just, just so you know. And, 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 and the fun part, the fun part will be, at, be in the end. Isn't, it's true. Yeah, it's true, yeah. Uh, Although it, 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 you know, it, 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 it sounds very serious here in the beginning of the end. It's not the end of the beginning, like Churchill said, this is the beginning of the end. Um, um, but then it becomes fun, I, I promise you. Um. It, it, it's not going to take more than seven minutes.
Sometimes, some people, like politicians and business people, need to do a speech, or write a preface, or generally appear in a context that is politically sensitive or even embarrassing. That was the time, at the time, so you see, I'm, I'm just following the script now. No, 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 no improvisation, no improvisation. That was the case at the time of the Iron Curtain, and today there are endless such examples when dealing with China. When, when they want to access the Chinese market, although the Chinese market is severely lacking in democracy, freedom of speech, and minority rights. And then the people who are doing this, they have to practice the art of diplomacy and try to sound friendly and talk about common interests and peace and friendship and progress and development without embarrassing themselves too much. And this results in a kind of speech and writing which is with a certain kind of like hollow, hollow tone, a certain kind of tone which can be very confusing to listen to until you understand what's going on. Right? <laughs> now, this is the autobiography of Jörn Demulius. It's called Tack, Tack for All Musiken. Thanks for all the music. And, and it has a preface by Cliff Richard. It says here, Me for a Cliff Richard. And um, um, and I would like to read this preface uh, to you uh, because it's, I find it very interesting, uh, and I can't let you leave without hearing this preface. And and to, in order to control that I'm not lying, you know, I'd like someone to check me here. <laughs> you can check. It says Sir Cliff Richard here. And then his signature here. And then this has a, some sort of this funny sort of flea market kind of font. Uh, you know, sort of, uh, I, I, I can pass it around a little bit. It, it's a very funny font. I don't understand why, why it's like such a font. Um, and, and the preface is published in Cliff Richard's original English, um, although the rest of the book is in Danish. Uh, and this might, of course, be that English is the international language and certainly the international language of rock and roll. But maybe it's also an attempt of the publisher to get as few Danes as possible to read this preface. Because it is kind of a strange preface. Um, there's something of the sound of this preface that's somehow out of tune. As if Cliff Richard for diplomatic reasons, for business reasons, had felt that he had to write this preface for this book, um, like by a fascist dictator or a communist dictator, uh, in order to sell you know, a few more records in some kind of totalitarian state. <laughs> but John Milius is not a dictator. I mean, he's, he, you know, he's a star in Denmark. He's a radio star in Denmark. You know, as much of a radio star you can be in Denmark you know, according to Jantelon. Uh, uh, he, he's a Danish radio and TV personality who's made, you know, a lot of programs about and with Cliff Richard. He's even written a whole book about Cliff Richard. And, and if, if Cliff doesn't want to write this preface, then I don't understand why he just doesn't do it. Um, on the other hand, if he then says yes to writing the preface, I don't understand what kind of risk he would be taking if he would have been a little bit more enthusiastic. <laughs> because face it, Cliff Richard, you know, writing a preface uh, for a book by Jörn Milius, like even even when it's announced on the cover, he's not going to sell that more, many more records. He's not going to sell that many more records in Denmark with having a preface in a book by John Reeves. I don't, I can't believe that. Um, well, 
Okay, we need the book back now. Oh, we need the book back. Oh. Do you have glasses on? So I know that you will be able to check it. Uh, and you sit on the front row, which is always a sign of seriousness. <laughs> Okay, so are you ready? Are you are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Jörn Jorgen has recorded many interviews with me. The first one being in 1964. I felt from the very beginning that he's a real music lover, and because we both fell in love with the rock and roll in the 50s, it created a special bond between us. Of course, over the years, we both. Ah, oh, sorry. It's correct until now, right? Yes. I, I was about to mess it up here. Of course, over the years, we have both had the opportunity of working in and enjoying the progress of. The language gets a bit technical here. But it's, um, it's right, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, two people checking now. One with glasses, one with glasses. Okay. Of course, over the years, we both had the opportunity of working in and enjoying the progress of this fantastic art form. Wait, 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 wait. I don't know the full details of Jörn's career. But I'm sure that he has many interesting things to share with all you readers. <laughs> Cliff Richard. <laughs> I don't know the full details of Jörn's career, but I'm sure that he has many interesting things to share with all you readers. Cliff Richard. <laughs> That's it. Thank, thanks for your patience. <laughs>